Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Let's do a quick sound check uh, for those who are on right now. You can let me know if the sound is, is coming through properly or not. All right, so today... I was asked by some brothers uh, to touch upon a subject which uh, sometimes doesn't really get touched on and sometimes does, uh, namely the Ahlul Bayt. And one of, part of our program, as part of our program, is that really Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, it's a blueprint of salvation. It's a blueprint on how people can get through this life. And not only that, many people imagine morality and the haq and the good and the right to be like a, a referee that people are basically saying like a referee of having too much fun or enjoying yourself too much that it comes in and it makes sure to ruin everything and make sure you're not having that much fun actually it's the opposite you have to look at it as you got this beautiful machine okay and this machine you can ruin it or you could use it right either one you want to use it well or you could ruin it and this Sharia, the law that the prophets come with, okay, you got your common sense in your mind with your aql, you have your common sense. But then you have this Sharia, which is telling you what, what you might not imagine is actually wrong, is wrong, is bad for you. And what you might not imagine is good for you, right, is in fact good for you. That's the instruction manual. When you get something, there are two, two types of people. There's one type of person who gets something and just uses it, right? And then there's another type of person who gets something and actually reads the manual, right? Well, the, the one who just uses it by himself, he, start, he achieves a little bit of success with it faster. But in the long run, the person who actually read the manual all right, benefits more. So we have to actually consider and imagine the, the shot. people's happiness, serenity, and enjoyment in this life before the next life. So much so that Rasulullah said, uh, this dunya hulwa wa khadra, this life is, is uh, sweet and green, meaning it can have a lot of benefit in this life. And also the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, tells us the hadith, which we mentioned last week, that one of the first things that's written down is, uh, am sa'id, whether this person is going to be happy or miserable. So this wahi of the Anbiya is a blueprint for us that we follow that gives us, maximizes our benefit and pushes away as much as possible the harm. It doesn't guarantee there's going to be no harm. There's going to be harm, but it pushes away as much as possible this type of harm, right? And delays it. And when that harm comes, it minimizes it, okay? So part of that blueprint is Mahabbat Ahl al-Bayt, one of the munjiyat that people will be saved by right, is love of Ahl al-Bayt. People will be saved by their mahabba of Ahl al-Bayt. As many things, a lot of flags of success in this, in this world, a lot of flags that bring the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and one of them is the love of Ahl al-Bayt. So some brothers had asked me to talk about it. So uh, one of the ayats of this, it comes from Surah Tashura. ذَلِكَ الَّذِي يُبَشِّرُ اللَّهُ عِبَادَهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Okay. Uh, this ayah tells us that the Prophet is saying to us, I'm not asking you for any wage. All that the Messenger is doing for us, he doesn't ask us for a single wage from him, from ourselves to him, except one thing. Love and be good to my family. Imam al nawi says, Al-Mawadda here in this meaning is that someone is has mercy for them and all the things that he would have for a regular Muslim, okay? You would overlook their flaws. You would have mercy for them. You would forgive them. You would be generous with them. You would prefer them over yourself. But he takes this to a higher level. Why? Because of their relation to the uh, Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Is it something from themselves that they did? No. Nope. It's just the fact that they're connected to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All right, just Allah has de uh, decreed that these people be descendants of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, the the popular question that always comes up: Well, what about people who make make things up? All right, people make things up all the time. Well, the ulama, the fuqaha said, 
look, it's not your really your responsibility to go around and check. So you're just going to give someone the benefit of the doubt. Uh, uh, you, you have nothing to lose by doing that, and you'll get rewarded either way. Okay, but you do have something to lose in doubting, suspecting, and then say, you know what, I'm not going to. So what are you going to do? Not going to give him respect, right? So it is a problem. It is a massive lie. And an ithm, if someone does claim to be from Ahl al-Bayt, where in fact he is not. Okay, so this is uh, one of the ayat that is crystal clear on the duty for a Muslim to recognize, if he sees Ahl al-Bayt, to recognize them and, and love them with the intention that this is one of the munjiyat. This is one of the reasons people can be saved. And the story of Sayyidina al-Imam Junaid al-Salik, okay? Sayyidina al-Imam Junaid Muhammad al-Salik, he was called Sayyid al-Ta'ifa, the chief of the Zuhad and the Arifin of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his era. And his story is that he was a wrestler. He was a young youth, Muslim youth, in a couple generations after the Sahaba. And he was, just like any other youth, into regular life. And he was a wrestler. He spent most of his time wrestling. So one time, a, there was a contest. The Khalifa in Baghdad put up a contest that just a wrestling, like a wrestling contest, just something for fun that they do in the afternoon hours, in the noon hours when it's hot out and they stay indoors. So uh, Junaid Salik signed up and he's wrestling one person after the next, after the next. And he's really just about to win the purse. Okay. The, the, the Khalifa had a big a golden purse. Uh, a, a purse of golden coins. So a man came up and said to him, uh, I want to sign up. And this man was not a wrestler. He was an older man. He was uh, had no experience wrestling. They didn't know him in the little wrestling circuit. So he they laughed at him. But the man said, look, uh, uh, you, you opened up a public tournament and I want to sign up. So the Khalifa said, fine. And the reigning champ is Junaid al uh, his name at the time is just Junaid. Uh, he comes up and he starts whispering something in the ear of this man. He starts whispering something. And he whispers, and what he was whispering was, I'm from Ahlul Bayt. So Junaid at this point doesn't understand what he means and he's about to wrestle the man. Then the man squeezes him. He says, look, I'm from Ahlul Bayt. Then finally Junaid understands. Ahlul Bayt, they're poor and the man looked poor. They're not allowed to receive zakah. He, and then he said to him, I'm from Ahlul Bayt. I'm not allowed to receive zakah. I need this money. I need this purse. So Junaid whispered back to him. He said, look, I'm going to make the moves, and then I'm going to squeeze. When I squeeze your arm, then you push. So I'll put myself in the position. And he did, and he got wrestled. Okay? He got pinned. So the Khalifa said, I was a one-off. Do it again. They did it a second time and a third time, and Junaid quickly walked out before anyone could talk to him. Okay, And the man was awarded the purse. So that night, Sayyidina al-Imam Junaid al-Salik uh, received the ru'ya, and he said, you lowered yourself for the sake of my family. And he looked up, and he found in this dream it was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You lowered yourself for the sake of my family, I will make sure that your name is elevated until Akhir al-Zaman, okay, until Yom al-Qiyamah, that your name was elevated until the Day of Judgment. Junaid slowly, after this dream, started to change, and he wasn't really doing anything haram to begin with, but he was just living a regular life, uh, what youth are interested in. And he started going to the masjid, started uh, sitting with the uh, mashayikh, and he became, in his own time, the sheikh that was considered uh, Sayyid al-Ta'ifa, Sheikh al-Zuhad wal-Arifin. Right, he was the sheikh of all the zuhad and all of the uh, people uh, who were interested in ma'rifah, coming to know Allah Azza wa Jal spiritually, and he was considered their sheikh in at the end of his life. So that was the story of Junaid al-Salik and how merely from Ahlul Bayt, right, merely from his love of Ahlul Bayt. Okay, so let's take a look. And this again, Imam Siyuti has this uh, uh, a risala on this, and uh, we always go back to. Imam Siyuti, because he is basically the one of the definitive uh, voices, uh, sources of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, and his um, book is called. It's not really a book; it's a treatise. Uh, it's probably in Al-Hawil Al-Fatawi. Ihya al Mayit bi Fadail Ahl Ihya al Mayit bi Fadail Ahl Al Bayt, and it's part of this book here, which I think people should get. All right, this book here is a really good book. 
It's called The Perfect Family, Virtues of Ahlul Bayt, translated by Khaled Williams. Uh, as Suyuti, Ibn Shaheen, and Nasa'i Bukhari, Muslim Nawi, and Ibn Hajar, collections from all of them. It's one of those books you want to have on your library. All right, great, uh, a great book here, a great resource. And this is the thing of, of the life of ilm. The life of ilm, you pick up one of these books every once in a while, you read a chapter, your sins come off. You share something from it, you can gain a mountain of sins right, uh, uh, off of you. Uh, transformed into good into hasanat and who of us doesn't have a mountain of maasi okay so in this type of book you just reading through the chapters of it uh is a, f- a form of dhikr and a form of purification he says here in a hadith the messenger of allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said iman shall not enter the heart of any muslim until he loves you for the sake of allah and the sake of my kin who is he talking to Right. Okay. Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam says here, faith shall not enter the heart of any Muslim until he loves you for the sake of Allah and the sake of my kin. All right. And he's talking to one of the Ahlul Bayt in this hadith. All right. Next hadith he says here, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, I implore you for Allah's sake to be mindful of my household. That means, yeah, his household will have in it all types of people. Right, but it's something close to his heart, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, just like any other person is close to their family's heart. Your offspring are going to be close to your heart. They're close to the messenger's heart. Peace be upon him. And so he, even if they have something here or there that is not the greatest example, extend more mercy to them than usual. And the one mistake that many people might think is the uh, that injustice justice doesn't apply to them well that's wrong that doesn't that's not what we're saying here nobody ever said that okay nobody's ever said justice doesn't apply uh, uh, another hadith from the messenger peace i leave you all right with that which if you cling to it you shall never go astray after me the book of allah and my family my household and they will never be divided until they come to me to the haud mind then how you look after them in my stead who narrated this at tirmidhi was sahahu declared it sound what hakim okay that zayd ibn arqam says these two things they will never separate until they reach the hawd of the messenger peace be upon him that means in amongst the ulama of deen the quran here symbolizes the quran itself obviously it's hifd it's study it's uh, knowledge and also all of the sacred law there's no point in guarding the Quran while aqidah is false or the Quran while fiqh is you know uh, unexamined. So it means here sacred knowledge that at the heart of the circles of sacred knowledge will be members of Ahlul Bayt until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Okay? Until Yawm Al-Qiyamah they will be there. So be mindful on them. Next hadith states, I leave with you that which if you cling to it you shall never go astray. You shall never go astray. And that's a wording in the previous hadith as well. All right? The book of Allah and my household. All right? You will never be astray if you make sure always to respect all right? sacred knowledge. The book of Allah here meaning sacred knowledge and Ahlul Bayt. You want to ruin all of your good deeds, disrespect Ahlul Bayt. Prophet wasallam said, I am soon to be called and I will answer. I leave you with the two weighty things. Okay. The book of Allah and my family, my household. This is by narrated in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad and also Abu Ya'la. The subtle and aware has informed me that they will never be divided until they come to the pool. Mind then how you look after them in my stead. In any circle of scholarship, look at the circles of the Ahnaf and the Malikiyah and the Shafi'iyah and maybe the Hanabila. Probably, I don't know. I'm not even familiar with many Hanabila today. Okay. Uh, I'm sure there's some out there. Look at the circles of Hufad, look at the circles of Hadith, you will find amongst them members of Ahlul Bayt. Okay, members of Ahlul Bayt. And here's the thing why is it this reward for people who love Ahlul Bayt? Because there's no reason you're extending that extra mercy, extra uh, um, generosity, extra kindness, extra overlooking and forgiving, except for the sake of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Now, because if it was obvious. If it was someone like who's done you a favor, or if it's someone pious, then it's obvious. 
it's known at that point why you're doing that. There's a justification that's rational. In this case, the person might be totally average, right? Maybe, right, bothers you even because they're human beings like anyone, everyone else. Some people imagine Ahlul Bayt to be something, you know, uh, that there's some light is shining around them. They're human beings like everyone else, right? So the only reason that you're doing this is for the sake of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the intention is absolutely pure, okay? Just in the same way that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hadith of Khadija, when he asked, is something wrong with me, right? That this revelation is coming? Prophet Sayyidina Khadija said, Wallahi la yukhzik Allahu abada. By Allah, Allah would never allow you, right? He would never let go of you. Okay, why? Because you take care of the poor, the orphan, the needy, those who have uh, requests, the guest, and your family. Who are all these? This six categories is the sixth category of the vulnerable. People who are vulnerable, okay, to being uh, pushed aside. Like there's no reason. They're not giving you any justification why they sh that you should be giving them any time. Okay, but, the, but Sayyidah Khadija says, these people whom you could easily dismiss to the side, you give them time. You help them, right? You support them. So when there's no reason, no benefit, okay, uh, for, for, for honoring someone, respecting someone, and giving them some extra good treatment, that doubles the reward for it because it means that you're only doing it for the sake of Allah. Anytime, any action, you can understand why you're doing it, the reward is less. Like being nice to your boss. Like you have no choice. You have to be. You, be you stand to benefit when you're nice to your boss, right? But being nice to some stranger on the road, okay, you have nothing to benefit, right? It's a, more of a reflection of a person's ikhlas, okay? But then when you think of the great benefits there are, all right, to uh, this type of attitude towards al bayt then you realize you actually stand a lot to benefit a lot. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, this is narrated by Tirmidhi and Al-Tabarani from Ibn Abbas, Love, uh, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Love Allah for the favors with which He sustains you." All right? Love Allah because of all the nice things Allah has given us. Love me for the sake of Allah's love. All right? Well, just because of you love Allah, what's your connection between Allah and His Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam? Is that He's the beloved of Allah, so He's your beloved? All right? Allah loves Him more than all of the creation, so you love Him more than all the creation. So you want to be in line. Next he said, and love my household for the sake of my love. So who does the Prophet ﷺ have? Who is dear to him? You think the Prophet ﷺ is not a human being who doesn't care about his family, okay? His, 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 the mothers of the believers, his wives, and his offspring, his offspring from Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib through Sayyidina Fatima Zahra. You think he doesn't care for them, that they don't have a special spot with him, just like any man would love his children. In fact, he loves them more. More than um, any average man would love his kids, okay? More than a mother would have mercy for her kids. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has that for his offspring, okay? Because that's a good thing. It's a good thing. And the Prophet's not saying here, do, allow, allow them to do injustice, give them all your money. He's not saying that. He's just saying, I love them, so you love them. That's it. What does it cost you? Nothing. Next hadith says, Al-Bukhari narrated that Abu Bakr Siddiq said, watch over Muhammad in his household. Right, which means, do you want to see reflections of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Okay, look at his household. There will be members of the Ahlul Bayt that will come that will reflect, right, something of the Prophet's attributes. Okay, and it's also, do you want to extend some good deed towards the Prophet? Well, the Prophet is not amongst you anymore, so extend that good towards his Ahlul Bayt. Al-Tabarani and Al-Hakim narrated on the authority of Ibn Abbas that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, O son of Abdul Muttalib, I ask, I ask Allah for three things for you all. So he's talking to his family. Three things I ask for you. To strengthen your hearts, to give you knowledge to those of you who are ignorant, and to guide those who are astray. The go those of you who are astray. And I asked him, all right, this is Ibn Abbas, to make you all, or the hadith continues, I ask him to make you all people of goodness, valor, and mercy. All right? And for were a man to stand between a ruqn and maqam, the two parts of the Kaaba, praying and fasting, then died whilst hating Ali Muhammad, he would enter hell. All right? I mean, this is why it's important. Some people imagine our scholarship 
uh, 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 what the ulama have given us. And everything just has to be a reaction and a relevant news. And what's, rea- what's the latest? This is not how we work. We have a blueprint. We got a big project, right? And it has many walls and it has many pillars, okay? And it needs lights and it needs heat and it needs carpeting and it needs flooring and furnishing. Islam is a house. It needs constant work, right? We build that house, all right? One piece at a time, okay? No builder goes in, today I'm putting up the bricks, right? Uh, Today I'm putting in the fireplace. And then someone comes up and says, well, is this relevant? Okay, yeah, it's relevant. It's a house, it's what we need. So like the house that we're building, which is in our beliefs and in our actions and in our heart, okay, that's the house we're going to see on Yom Al-Qiyamah. So we're building. And this is a critical pillar, all right, Muhammad's Ahl al-Bayt. So he says here that uh, who, if a man was to pray and fast all his life and stand between the Rukun and the Maqam, Maqam Ibrahim, okay, and the Rukn al-Yamani, and stand there praying, but he has hatred for Ahl al-Bayt, he would enter the hellfire. Right, that's how serious it is. Okay, that's how serious the matter is. At Tabarani narrated on the authority of Ibn Abbas, the Messenger of Allah said, To hate the Banu Hashim and the helpers is unbelief. And to hate the, the Arab in general is hypocrisy. Why? Because the Prophet's one of them. That's a Tabarani hadith. Tabarani, of course, wrote a Mu'jam, which what does a Mu'jam begin with? The Mu'jam is categorized by the top of the chain, which is the Sheikhs. At Tabarani's sheikhs, Tabarani's teachers. One of them was Nasa'i. And uh, he has three versions of his book. The small, the middle, and the large. Uh, Al-Mu'ajam Al-Kabir, the large one, the original one. Then he shortened it. All right? And then that, that became Al-Awsat. And then he shortened that even more. Al-Saghir, the small one. Okay, So Al-Mu'ajam Al-Kabir was Saghir. And in the middle is Al-Awsat. So he has three versions of the Mu'ajam. And again, this word is important if you study hadith. Mu'ajam is a hadith book categorized by the teachers of uh, the author. The opposite of a mu'ajam is the musnad. He goes by the bottom of the chain. He categorizes the hadith by the sahaba. Okay. Hadith number 13. Ibn Adi narrated on the authority of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. Anhu, Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa says, whoever hates us, this household is a, is a hypocrite. No one hates Ahl al-Bayt except the munafiq. Ibn Hibban, in his Sahih, Ibn Hibban is one of four who authored Sihah. Ibn Hibban, Ibn Khuzayma, and of course Bukhari and Muslim. Ibn Khuzayma's book is lost. 75% of it's lost. We only have the first quarter of it, which is Tahara, Salah, and the, the, those early Ibadat, parts of the Ibadat. So there are only four books that ever claim to be purely Sahih Hadith. So uh, Al-Hakim, as well, narrated, on the authority of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, by the one in whose hand is my soul, no man hates us, this household, save that Allah sends him to hell. So, I mean, because why would you hate them? You, you envy their position, right? Well, that's exactly what Iblis did to the human being. The relationship between a regular, like, like most of us, regular people and Ahl al-Bayt, is that we ask ourselves, why did Allah prefer them over us, right? They did nothing. They literally did nothing to earn to become from Ahl al-Bayt, right? Likewise, what did... Prophet Adam, alayhi salam, our father, do to earn right, his position. Nothing. Allah just gave it to him. So you can't have hiqad. You can't have hasad. On, if, if Allah wills to give something to someone, right? you can't have hasad for that. And Allah told Iblis to bow down to Adam, i.e. respect him. Because I, because I said so. Period. He did nothing yet. At, what had Adam done to be bowed down to? He hadn't even breathed. Same thing here. We're told, love these people for the sake of the Prophet. Because it's a test. It's one of those tests. You love your Prophet, then love his descendants, wh- whoever they are. There's only one thing that removes you from being a descendant of the Prophet, so I said them. Actually, there's the, the Nasl al-Nabawi, the descendants of all Prophets, actually has something unique about it, and that is, once they leave Islam, they're no longer Ahl al-Bayt. All right? Once they leave Iman, that's why the Bani Israel, as, they're, they're called the sons of Yaqub, which is, Israel is the name of Yaqub. Bani Israel, okay, the sons of Israel, until they reject the Prophet Isa bin Maryam, they stopped being called Bani Israel. They're now called Al Yahud, which is Bani Yahuda, the next a person in the lineage who is a non prophet, right? Al Yahud, the sons of Yahuda, who was one of the sons, uh, one of the, uh, the early forefathers that they shared, who was not a prophet. So that's accurate. So on the sons of Yahuda, 
right, is accurate, right? Because they are the sons of Yehuda, but they can no longer be attributed to a Nabi because of their kufr, right, by rejecting Sayyidina Isa bin Maryam. Okay, so once they rejected Sayyidina Isa bin Maryam as a Messiah, right, as a prophet, as their savior, right, who was going to rectify their whole situation, that was the last straw because they had rejected many MBA and killed many MBA, right? But once they, this was the final straw, they had broken the covenant with Allah Azza wa Jal permanently, and therefore they are no longer called uh, Bani Israel. They're called Al Yahud, okay? Al Yahud. So someone who t calls the Israelis today the Bani Israel uh, is mistaken because you cannot attribute yourself, one cannot attribute himself to a prophet if he's made ridda, if he's made kufr. Right, and that also goes to show you can pray and fast and be in the sight of Allah a kafir. Right, you pray and fast and you have to heed and you recite the book all day, but because of one of your beliefs, you're a kafir. Okay. All right. How long have we been going here? Twenty-five minutes. All right. So, what is the what is the one of the reasons that people? have any issue with Ahlul Bayt, it's envy. The same thing with Iblis, right? Envy. Why should he get something for nothing, right? The Prophet addresses it here in another Tabarani Hadith. He says here, all right, beware of hating us for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, all right, uh, no one hates, this is Al-Hasan Ibn Ali said to one of the people who had issues. He said, no one hates us, the Prophet said, no one hates us and no one envies us, save that he will be driven from the haud, the pool, on the day of resurrection with whips of fire. All right? So it is a, a part of our heart, part of our deen, and something that we should always revive. Right, And it's one of those things that really only gets talked about every once in a while in the uh, time of Muharram. But, I mean, it's part of our deen. It's part of something that we bring up all the time. So that's the issue. Uh, and there are many other hadiths. I think uh, this is enough uh, because it's the same idea over and over. And this is another beautiful hadith by Al Bazar. Uh, the household, Ahlul Bayt, is like Noah's Ark. Whoever boards it is saved, and whoever rejects it is drowned. And the analogy, it's in a weak hadith, but it's a good analogy that all the ulama accept that Ahlul Bayt are like a, the ship, okay? And the Sahaba are like the stars. So if you're a seaman, out there, a seaman out there, uh, if you're on a ship, you need both, right? You can't not have the stars. How are you going to navigate, right? And you can't not have a ship, okay? So this is, we have tawafuq, and all of Ahlul Sunnah al-Jama'ah, its mark is ta complete tawafuq between Ahlul Bayt and Sahaba, and anyone who tries to make it that, oh, you can't love both, you have to love one or the other, that is someone who doesn't really have much experience uh, reading the books and being with the people of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And one of the biggest concentrations of Ahl al Bayt that we have tawthiq, uh, like documentation that there actually are Ahl al Bayt, are all of the Hadarim, the Ba'alawi Sayyids of Hadramaut. It's Muwathaq, absolute. There's no doubt that their lineage goes back to Ahl al Bayt. And look at all their children. They're all Abu Bakr and Umar. All of them are named Abu Bakr and Umar. Why? To show and to prove that they're different from the Zaydi Shiites from north, from the north who ha, who take issue with Abu Bakr and Umar okay the Zaydis in the in theory many people mistaken the Zaydis that in theory that they can accept Abu Bakr and Umar and they're just tafdili they just preferred Ali over Abu Bakr and Umar but those tafdili Zaydis right they actually dissolved long ago into the Hanafis of Iraq they dissolved into the Hanafi community of Iraq and the Zaydis today, they still take issue with Abu Bakr and Umar. There's no, there's, there's no doubt about that. Otherwise, uh, Imam al-Haddad lived his whole life under those people. Imam al-Haddad, those Zaydis from the north Yemen, from Sana'a, conquered Tarim for 88 years. All right? The Ottoman Empire, came, when coffee was discovered, the Ottoman Empire went into Mocha, which is the, 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 the name of the coffee comes from a seaport in Yemen called Mocha. Mocha. They went in there. And they took over northern Yemen so they can control the coffee trade, right? That's the only reason Yemen was ever important in world history, right? Is the coffee, discovery of coffee. So the Ottomans controlled it for about 100 years. The, the, Yemeni, the Zaydis of the north Yemen were fighting the Ottomans for that whole period of time. Finally, 
the cat was out of the bag and uh, and coffee was now grown everywhere. So the Ottomans did not need mocha anymore. So they just got up and left, right? Now, the Zaydis who were fighting the Ottomans all these years, they got really good at warfare. So immediately, as soon as the Ottomans left, the Zaydis took over all of Yemen because they were so good at warfare. So they conquered all of it. And they uh, the Hadarim call it Sayyilul Layl because they came in, took over Hadramaut in one night. Like uh, it was like a flood. The, the soldiers came in, surrounded the place, and took over. Fired all the Sunni imams and put in Zaydi imams. And part of the Zaydi creed is that they're Qadris. They, uh, they don't believe that evil comes uh, from Allah, that only evil comes from you. So that's why Imam al-Haddad put in the Ratib, in the word, wal khair wa sharu bi mashi'atillah, right? That good and evil comes by Allah's will, right? So because the Shi'i sects, the three Shi'i sects, the Zaydis, Ismailis, and the Twelvers, uh, they're all uh, basically Mu'tazilite in their creed and didn't believe that you have certain elements of, uh, they didn't believe in certain elements of Qadr. Okay? So uh, that's why Imam al-Haddad did that. And that's why Imam al-Haddad, he has letters debating Zaydi imams, private letters, which I have because I was able to get them from the descendants of uh, uh, Imam al-Haddad during my PhD thesis. And uh, traveled far and wide to, to, to search them and they're just a couple bound books and we copied them and in them he has debates and that's why Imam al-Haddad insists to guard the Sunnis from becoming Shi'is or being influenced by Shi'ism is that he says that Sayyidina al-Imam Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan is a Khalifa he says even he didn't call himself a Khalifa but we call him Khalifa right to, to make sure that people know Right, that we honor and respect all of the companions. If you start with disrespecting Sayyidina Imam Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, there's there's no really there's no going back. Right, you're going to eventually. Then, if you honor Muawiyah, why don't you honor the one who put him in his job and kept him there? Sayyidina Omar put him in. Sayyidina Omar was about to remove him, but he he was killed. Sayyidina Uthman came and kept him on the job. Right, so it's very easy to go to Uthman. Right. Once you go to Muawiyah, once you become easy in crit criticizing Muawiyah, you go to Uthman, Sayyidina Uthman. Once you're at Sayyidina Uthman, you're at the 10 Mubashireen. It's just a matter of time before you get to Abu Bakr and Umar. Right? So, and once you get there, it's a matter of time to get Sayyid Aisha. So you have disrespected the Prophet by proxy. No Muslim disrespects the Prophet directly. Rather, actually, I, should, I shouldn't uh, say that. It's just leave it to the, uh, uh, some of these modern folks to keep you, you know, surprised. They always surprise you with something. But no, no Muslim group has ever disrespected the Prophet, peace be upon him, as a policy, as theology, right? Uh, as doctrine, directly. Rather, it's all by proxy, right? By disrespecting Sayyidina Isha, you've disrespected the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. Because uh, Prophet Sallallahu said, the Jews and Christians, everything they do, you're going to imitate. There will be some people in my ummah who will imitate them, right? So we ask the question, didn't the Yahud kill many prophets and disrespected many prophets, right? Well, where is any Muslim who does that? Well, no one does it directly, but they do it by proxy. So this is why uh, the issue of Al al-Bayt and the issue of the Sahaba, there is zero tension in Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama'ah between loving and respecting both. Okay, One as the ship and the other as the stars. All right? And if you look at most of the spiritual guides in the Ummah are from Ahl al-Bayt and most of the Fuqaha and Mutakallimeen, they're not from Ahl al-Bayt. Right? They're uh, from other lineages. Okay? And Al al Bayt is something special. The Prophet ﷺ said, All lineages become meaningless on the day of judgment, except my lineage. And the people who are being surrounded him are on the Yom al Qiyamah. He specified two people those who have much salah and salam upon him, and those who, have, who are from his family. Of the Mu'mineen, remember, there's no injustice here. No Al al Bayt is going to slap you up, upside the head and get away with it because he's Al al Bayt. That's not how it works, right? Rather, it's the opposite. When justice comes down, it comes down double on Al al Bayt. And that's in the Quran. O oh, wives of the Prophet, if you fear Allah, you get double the reward. If other than that, right, double the punishment. Okay? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is more uh, hirsan, he has more uh, concern that his family be upright and be doing no injustice than anyone else, right? Because they reflect on him. So on Yom al Qiyamah, if someone comes with a da'wah that says, Oh, Al al Bayt did this to me. Rasulullah, what are you going to do? Do you think Rasulullah is going to say, he's my Ahl al-Bayt, just, just go out, get out of here, right? Forget about it. No, right? Rasulullah is, is one of justice, and he loves his ummah, and from his ummah is Ahl al-Bayt. So this relationship should never be 
uh, awkward, should never be have any tension, and we should understand both that ashabi kan nujum bi ayyihim muhtadaytum muhtadaytum wa mathalu ahlu bayti ka safinati nuh the example of my household is uh, the safina of nuh alayhi salam man rakibaha naja wa man takhallafa anha gharq whoever uh, rides it is safe whoever turns its back on his back on it is uh, drowned wa ashabi kan nujum and my companions are like the stars whichever one of them you follow you'll be guided Right? And of course, there are some Sahaba, more senior, more scholarly, more knowledgeable. Even you can say, uh, actually more pious, we'll leave that, uh, we won't say that. But there are some Sahaba, of course, are closer than others to the Prophet, peace be upon him. They're not all equal. And the Quran, Surah Al-Hashr tells us that. Right, Those who were made the Hijrah are at one level. Those of the Ansar are at another level. Those who became Muslim only after it was over and the conquest occurred are yet at another level. Okay, So... Uh, uh, they're not all equal, so it's a weak hadith, but the meaning is sound. And the whole idea behind our organization, Safina Society, was that I actually wanted originally to make this image, this mural, right, that the ship and the stars around it, that that's our guidance, al Bayt and the Sahaba. And that's a great representation of the balance that Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah has, right? But the graphics of it didn't allow for the stars, so we just had to put the ship. And then the black and white at the bottom represents this dunya. Some of it's good and some of it's bad. We have to be balanced. We're not going to be, it's all bad and then it's all good. So that was the idea uh, with Safina Society. So I think we can open up now and take people's questions, uh, comments. I'm getting a lot of comments on uh, this guy who wants putting up screenshots. All right, I told you these guys have basically, uh, they're time wasters. And it got me thinking about time wasters. And some of you wanted me some of you from those who actually have some respect uh, uh, wanted me to explain this, why I said that uh, certain things, those things aren't important. Firstly, I had detected right away that the guy, some of you might not know what I'm talking about, but that's fine. It's just a bunch of time wasting stuff. But just a clarification for some of my friends out there. I, the guy sent me a message. I realized right away he is a time waster. So I didn't even read most of his message. And he was just listing some things and saying, why don't you talk about these things instead of, the issue of Prophet Isa alayhi salam, and my response was simply that those things aren't really, uh, this is more important, those things aren't that important, because he had mentioned some weak narrations that there were servant girls walking around bare-breasted in Medina, or that Musa alayhi salam, there's a hadith about his clothes were taken away, and that all the Bani Israel saw him, and, and, and I said, Mizzah, those aren't things that are part of really aqidah, right? So it's not important, right? If you, if you don't believe that, I mean, it's you're not negating something of aqidah. It doesn't make you a fasiq, okay? If you don't want to believe in that one hadith, which is a sound hadith, right? But if you don't want to, and it has a wisdom behind it, uh, if you understood it. But it, let's say someone got something in his head and doesn't want to believe in it. That's not part of the Quran. It's not an aqidah issue. From that aspect, those two, this uh, issue of Isa is far more important than the other two. The other thing is that uh, the other things he read, which I had looked at later at, because once someone's a time waster, you don't have to look at everything he says. But he had said something about rape and sex with children. And I thought to myself, well, that's not an issue either because we don't say that. Nobody says that, right? No one's confirming that, right? So it, to me, it's an, those things are not an issue. Do you think any, any Muslim, any scholar would condone rape and would condone having sex with some immature child? No. We say maturity is at different levels, right? And look, if someone... Uh, is thinking and imagining that we condone rape, right? And 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 going around having sex with children, okay? Then even in our Sharia, right? The the women of the community decide when a woman is mature. If you look at the books of fiqh, right? The women of the community are the ones who know when a person can can have intercourse or not, right? And they decide. That's what determines what a child is, right? So. If anyone imagines that that, that is uh, any scholar would have condoned that, then he's sick in the head. So I didn't really understand what the point of the guy was, except that he was a defender of his, his teacher. And he's upset, so he wants it to get back at me at it. But anyway, it's a, it's a waste of time. Uh, and we'll take the next question now. Uh, where are the majority of Ahlul Bayt today? Uh, they're all over the Muslim world. Ahlul Bayt are all over the Islamic world, and you can find them all over the place. Uh, let's see what else we got here. 
Let's go from the top. Which book are you reading from? Again, it's the perfect family. Virtues of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam. All right. Abdul Samad Ali, marhaban bikum. Feel free to comment at any time. Mubashir Ishtiaq says, could you please explain the hadith I was a prophet while Adam was still between the spirit and the body? Yes, because all the MBA are deemed prophets right as soon as they're created. Okay, The, the prophecy is not something that's given. So the, uh, the creation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is there before the creation of his mud. So before the creation of Adam Alayhi Salam, uh, um, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam existed in the knowledge of Allah as a prophet. Okay. And some hadith even narrate uh, that hadith from Enes that the first creation of the of Allah Azza wa Jal was the light of the Messenger, peace be upon him. Many people attack this hadith for being weak. And some of them say, uh, have Hassanahu made it Hassan. Right, that um, between that the first creation was not the pen, was actually the light of the messenger, peace be upon him. So, in that respect, uh, Murad Uthman, Barakallahu Feek, feel free to chime in at any time. Afif Ali Mansur says, Is it true that the majority of Ahlul Bayt are Shia in their religion? Not even close. Amjad Hussein, uh, uh, firstly, there's not even a census, but just from a scan, the amount of Ahlul Bayt that exists inside of Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah are far greater than. The total number of Shias, let alone the number of Shias. Okay. All right, Amjad Hussein, may Allah bless you. Uh, yeah, Sayyidina uh, Muawiyah ibn Nabi Sufyan is known as the curtain of the Sahaba. Sayyidina Muawiyah, by the way, is someone that the Prophet chose to be a scribe of the Quran. Do you think the Prophet doesn't know what he's how, what he's deciding? Right. Raida Wilson says, what about the Qur'anis? Okay, they're very disrespectful, almost blasphemous of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Qur'anis are basically, yeah, maybe the Qur'anis. Uh, yeah, maybe you're right. Actually, she's right. I told you, there, you, you never underestimate anything in this modern era. Uh, in terms, when it comes to disrespecting the religion, don't ever put anything past anyone. Because these Qur'anis are full of disrespect to the Prophet. And the greatest disrespect is that we don't need his guidance. And that's what they're saying. So she's right about that. And these people are... Um, uh, always like this loud minority and the Qur'anis at, at some point I don't even know if they're going to be counted as Muslim because some of them don't even believe in Salah which is mutawatir and there's ijma upon the fact that Muslims pray five times a day and that uh, Dhuhr and Asr are silent Maghrib, Isha and Fajr are out loud some people say there's no ijma there is plenty of ijma that we pray five times a day that Dhuhr and Asr are silent while the other prayers are out loud that assalamu alaikum exits you out of the salah, that Allahu Akbar enters you into salah. There's ijma and all that. So someone who says there's no ijma, there's plenty of ijma. All right, who is Marwan? Marwan, um, Marwan was a cousin of Sayyidina Uthman who was behind the fitna. He was the one who was the source of the fitna. And he is the one who forged the letter in Uthman's name to assassinate the son of Abu Bakr Siddiq, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, who was given the rule of Egypt. And then Uthman, then Marwan wrote, forged a letter in the name of Sayyidina Uthman to have him assassinated. Okay, But the letter was uncovered. So a whole group of people came down from Egypt and they uh, came around the... Uh, the uh, palace of Sayyidina Uthman or the home of Sayyidina Uthman and the fitna started all from Marwan. Okay. So we can talk about Marwan another time. All right, let's see what else we got here. He says, can we have a talk on uh, Imam al-Hassan? Yeah, sure, one day we'll do that. 
I don't know why some of these comments aren't coming on the phone. Um, and they're only coming on the computer. Can current Christians and Jews, this question from Lotfullah al Chishti, can current Christians and Jews be included in Ahl al Kitab? Yes, uh, according only to the three madhabs, Al Shafi'i is the strictest on Ahl al Kitab. He says they must actually present a lineage back to the Ahl al Kitab at the time of the Prophet. The logic being that a pagan who enters into Judaism or Christianity won't be considered Ahl al Kitab. Only those who were Ahl al-Kitab before the, the revelation came are to be respected as Ahl al-Kitab. But the other three madhabs don't have that idea, and therefore they are Ahl al-Kitab. Okay? They are Ahl al-Kitab. Uh, and we consider their, if they slaughter meat, then their meat is halal for us to eat. This question says, what about Ahl al-Kitab regarding Akhir uh, zaman Yes, there is a connection between Ahl al-Kitab and Akhir al-Zaman, which is namely that Imam al-Hasan ibn Ali, okay, is the forefather of the Imam, the great Imam al-Mahdi, okay, al-Mahdi. The Imam al-Mahdi, his sign is that the Ummah will accept him, all right, and that he will bring much futuhat for the Muslims. And then at the end of his reign, when the Dajjal comes, he'll be cornered with the Muslims and there will be tough battles and difficult battles. But he is from the descendants of Al-Hasan. Some people said that the mother is from Al-Hussein, but what's documented for sure is that uh, is, is for sure is that the he is from the descendants of Sayyidina Al-Hasan ibn Ali. And who is it who is going to be a follower of Imam al-Mahdi? Right? And we're, we, we have to strengthen that belief because towards the end of time, many people are actually their belief in matters of Akhiru zaman starts to dwindle and become darkened, and they don't have any belief in Akhiru zaman right? And they don't believe that there's going to be something called Imam al-Mahdi, or there's something called uh, the Dajjal, and these types of folks. So uh, uh, we have to revive that. We have to make sure, because that's something that gives people hope. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said these things for a reason, Right? He said them for a reason. And the argument that, well, why isn't it in the Qur'an? Well, salah is not in Qur'an. How to pray is not in the Qur'an. Are you going to tell me that's not important? Right? Uh, you know, so a lot of things are, just because something's not in the Qur'an, Allah has done that on purpose so that you have no choice but to rely on the Messenger, peace be upon him. And just as you rely on him for how to pray, you rely on him for everything else that he's, he gives us. And 20 Sahaba narrated that there's something called Imam al-Mahdi, that he's going to come. Now, what are we going to do? Just sit here and wait and watch the news and see what he's coming? No, we're going to get to work building the house of Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah. We'll get to work with ourselves, supporting the other ulama out there doing it, the other uh, students of knowledge that are out there doing it and those studying, supporting them, right? And getting busy. Our households, you know, our kids should be memorizing Qur'an, right? The household, all of us should be memorizing the Quran at all. It's one of the best things to save our iman, is to be into the circles of hifl, right? And almost having a good competition. How much do you have? How much do I have? Well, when did you memorize that, right? And then constantly reviewing with one another, right? That's what a Muslim friendship is all about, right? You're on a car ride, review. You got a guest, take five minutes and review a surah. The Quran etched in your heart. And etched in your memory purifies for every time that that person is reciting a surah, it's purifying him. It's one of the best things he could do. Study in aqid and fiqh, one of the best things a person could do. Okay, so uh, that's that's what we're doing. That's what we're getting busy doing, and we're not going to be distracted by time wasters, right? That people just uh, dra drama queens, people who unfortunately make dua for them. They they have mental issues, right? And just make dua for them. Don't engage them. That's it. That's our that's our position with those types, right? That want to drag you into a black hole, and uh, and and I've been dragged in black holes in the past, and I'm sure many of you have too. But I learned the lesson. What's the point of experience if you don't learn the lesson? Don't get dragged into black holes, okay? Like some of these people do, and they try to drag you. You don't. There's a ruling. You don't have to answer everyone who talks to you, right? You don't have to formulate an opinion on every question that comes up. Right, you don't, and if you formulate one, you don't have to share it publicly. 
right? And enter into these black holes of drama with people that they have emotional situations, right? And if someone's having an emotional situation, leave them alone, right? Go back to our business. We're, we're busy. Honestly, we're busy. This book right here, I'm recording. I'm actually recording it directly from a Siyuti, from the, the Hawi and relying on this translation. It was, the work is by Aftab Malik, right? And I'm recording this and it's going to go on Safina Online on the Teachable, all right? Where you'll be able to read the Arabic. So if you're studying uh, Arabic, because that's something else we got to get busy with, learning Arabic, right? Most of these mistakes are done because we don't know Arabic. Read the Arabic and I'll be commenting on it, right? Right, reading the Arabic with you, translating, giving some i'rab, okay, what's marfu'a, what's mansub, why, etc. Basic stuff, ajrumiya level stuff, and then giving a commentary so that, and it's going to go on Safina online.teachable, Safina dash online.teachable.com, and in a, maybe a week or two, I'll finish it. But that's what we got to get busy with, right? The real work and building this house. Let's see the next question here. Muhammad Omar Mustafa, which by the way, I, th I think he's the same person, did a great job sharing all the uh, positions of the ulama on the issue of uh, Sayyidina Isa bin Maryam coming down. And that's, that's what I say. We cover the point, right? Our, our, our concern is the issue, right? And, and we repeat the issue if it, ha if it comes up, that anyone who tells you Sayyidina Isa bin Maryam is not coming down, it's a quack that ought to be listened to. I'm not going to go making takfir of people because I would have to sit someone down and see what they said, and I don't have time for that, right? And there needs to be a quda, right? But once uh, someone says that, you're you're sort of on the bye-bye, you're gone, right? You're you're just like a flu away from sanity. And it's just like saying someone who has cancer, right? You know, uh, saying, you're, or, uh, saying something like um, alcohol doesn't cause liver cirrhosis. Alcohol is good for your liver. Right in the medical community, if you said that, how would you be treated? Like a quack, right? Or someone says Tylenol actually is bad for you and it causes cancer. Really? We've taken Tylenol for all these years. No, no one never got cancer from it. You're a quack. Okay, so we would say that. So the point, and he did a good job on his page, and he asked now, Ma inna laysa haqiqa. What's the hukm on someone who says that there's no sihr, that there's no reality of sihr? The hukum on the person is that he is uh, gone, basically. He is far off from what all of our ulama say. And my policy on actual takfir, and really the policy of the ulama, is uh, that it should, you should have some tawakuf on the takfir element. But the point is, right, the point is that uh, the comment that it doesn't exist is nonsense. Okay, it's nonsense. So maybe he's a a fasiq, maybe a kafir, right? Listen, when you don't make takfir of someone, that's not a reward. That's not a prize, right? When someone says, oh, I don't make takfir of someone, what do you say? to not be a kafir is not an achievement, okay? We want to try to be on the path as Dalai al-Khairat often repeats the dua, right? Amitna ala sunnati wal jama'ah. In any event, forget people, let's talk about the points. Uh, Khalid says, a lot of things are mutawatir, like changing the qibla. It's not in the Quran, but no, uh, well, it is in the Quran from فَوَلِّ وَجْهَكَ شَطْرَ الْمَسْلِ Haram from that aspect. It is in the Quran, but no from Allah uh, when Allah tells Muslims to turn back uh, to Mecca. Anyways, uh, how can Shia understand Quran without Hadith as they believe Sahaba are bad, etc. But Hadith comes from them. Good question. They rely on like a certain number of Hadith that not others. Assalamu alaikum from Sharifa Morgan. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Is it true that the Sibd children born from Ahl al Bayt women and not Ahl al Bayt fathers will be Ahl al Bayt in the Akhirah according to some Sunni scholars? That is correct. As a ruling of zakah, right, the, the outward rulings, accepting the khums and not accepting zakah and other such rulings, then Ahl al Bayt will be those from the father only. But actually, there is a narration that says that the sons and daughters of one generation removed from the girls, right, from the girls of Ahl al-Bayt are, right, uh, considered Ahl al-Bayt as well, right? So one generation of removed, but they won't pass it on in a legal sense, but they'll be considered from Ahl al-Bayt. And in Akhirah, yes, they will be considered uh, from Ahl al-Bayt. That's something that I've heard, that no, even if legally they're not Ahl al-Bayt now, but in Akhirah they will be. Likewise. 
Do you think all Ahl al-Bayt is monitored? There are people walking around, right? They don't have any clue that they descend from father, from father, from father, all the way back to someone from Ahl al-Bayt. Because many times people hid it, hid that they were from Ahl al-Bayt because of persecution. Next question. Tattoos, are they haram? Tattoos are haram in every madhab. Uh, Kamran Hussein says, how do I have to classify myself? I would just say, look, just classify yourself as uh, a Sunni and study, right? And study the issues one at a time. And any of those points that were stated in, in some of the authors of the past and um, that are attributed to the Diobund, okay? Uh, we say, look, those points are blasphemous. There's no doubt about it. So uh, it, on the point, of saying something like to think of the donkey is better than think of the prophet. What ayadu billah, subhanallah. I mean, that is the, one of the ins, most insane thing that I've ever heard. All right. So that, I mean, that would be, I, I, if someone said that, uh, the Madakia would get executed, right? I mean, the Madakia would execute you for something like that, right? I mean, there's not even a doubt about that. Qadi Ayyad in his book, I mean, we know the story that some Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah issued a fatwa that you can't visit the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You can't visit the Prophet, peace be upon him. You just visit the mosque, and by coincidence, the Prophet is there. The scholars of the Malikis at that time issued a fatwa of his riddha, right? I mean, that's how serious they are on the respect of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So you make a disrespectful say, you better take it back, and I, I hope he took it back. And And I heard from some people that he took it back. Allah knows best. I'm not going to investigate. It's not my business, not my problem. But the statement itself is a blasphemy that's uh, kufr right there. But I'm not going to get into that politics, whether he took it back or not. But I heard he took it back, and Allah knows best. In any event, uh, Muhammad Memon says, remember when your Lord said to the angel, Surah Al-Baqarah, a scholar while commenting on this verse said that from the word remember, it implies that Rasulullah wasallam was witnessing events before his birth. Uh, and hence knows the events of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam and Sayyidina Isa and others. Is this a correct uh, understanding? Well, Allahu Alam, I never saw that tafsir. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting point that you make. I would want to make uh, to, to, to refer to it and see uh, what actually is said about that tafsir. Right? What else we got? All right, here's a question from Hamza Aziz. It says, in the podcast of the Awliya, Sheikh Abu Madian, it was said, it stated that Sheikh Abdul Qadr al Jalani imparted many secrets of Tasawwuf to Sheikh Abu Madian. He adorned him with the keys to the spiritual illumination. Could you elaborate upon this, Sheikh? What does this refer to? This is something that is from the matters of the Arifin, which I don't want to speak outside of my depth on the matters of the Arifin. However, it is said uh, that when an Wali dies, he finds someone in this life to impart his wisdom into his heart, okay? And how this occurs, Allah knows best. This is something from that they talk about that's limited to their knowledge of their uh, uh, awareness of these ma'arif, and it's something that I'm not familiar with, that's for sure. But that is what the ulama say, that uh, that they uh, uh, impart their wisdom onto someone else from uh, the earth so that there is always someone carrying that wisdom, and sometimes they divide it amongst their other people, and Allah knows best, but that is something that's uh, been said between Sayyidina Abdul Qadr al-Jilan and Sayyidina Imam uh, Al-Ghoth Abu Madian. Hamza Zamani says, any plans on California tour? Another brother had asked about England. I was actually going to go to the UK this summer, but uh, I ended up being invited for the Hajj, and no one could say no to that. California, I mean, I don't know. They, I don't get an odd vibe from those people out there. I don't know if uh, I would have any reception out there. So you're going to have to tell me that if there'd be any, any, any reception out there because I go in and I'm talking normal and all of a sudden the people get scared, like they're nervous. And I'm like, what's going on? I'm just talking normally. And someone told me that, you know, people really have to be soft in California. So I get that feeling from the Californians, but uh, uh, maybe someday we'll make it out there. Farhan Jawad said, can my mother lead me in prayer even if I'm an adult? I feel she has more taqwa than me and I feel embarrassed to lead her. You have to lead her in the salah. She can lead you in dua and in education, but in salah, you're going to have to lead. 
Mubashir Ashtiaq says, what is a Qutb and what are the Abdal? I'm going to have to say, look, I'm not going to discuss those subjects because that is from the uh, deep subjects that in terms of uh, scholarly, like outward knowledge of Ahadith and um, and such, you can refer to Imam Al-Suyuti's Hawi Lil Fatawi for the Hadith on that subject. He holds that between Hadith and the experience of the ulama and the ma'rifa and the illumination or the uh, I should say the unveilings mukashafat of the awliya that this is true that there is something called the hierarchy of awliya but um, so imam al-suyuti does uphold that right uh, and and he's you know he's who he is so he does uphold that so we don't negate it at all for sure and we know that it is out there something real called abdad for sure 100% but what about their details? We're not going to talk about it because that requires, first of all, um, some more knowledge and some more, um, you know, certain things you have to know when you have to stop at it. And anyway, it's not one of those things that we were taught is a benefit, beneficial knowledge. It's knowledge, right? It's definitely something, uh, but it's not something that uh, is one of those that benefits a person in his day to day. So we'll leave it at that to avoid any confusions. But maybe one day we'll, we can pick out the hadith and read them. I have no problem if it's a, if it's a hadith that Imam Suyuti considers it to be part of the deen, right? Then uh, we'll discuss it. No shame in discussing that, right? And and for my part, I'll just transmit it. I'm not going to comment and say who's who and things like that. I used to be into that when I was younger, but not anymore. Uh, Hamza Aziz says, we need a Canadian tour. I didn't know you were Canadian, All right? Reception won't even be an issue here. All right, good. Okay, any highly recommended books? Yeah, this, just have this in your house. This you should have in your house and pick up every once in a while to refresh that element of our Mahabba Ali al-Bayt. And just this Majlis Dhikr right here that we're doing is in the sight of Allah, big, huge, right? To revive Mahabba of these people in our hearts just by reading these ahadith, right? When will you do another group podcast? We're recording this week, but it's not going to come out this week. Tomorrow's podcast is going to be me and Rashid Dar. Uh, a, a smart, intelligent, sharp young man who um, I, I had over my house and we talked. Uh, it was before we got this nice mic set, though. So uh, the sound is okay. It's not bad. It's okay. Uh, but that'll be tomorrow's podcast, me and Rashid Dar. And um, uh, the next week after that will be the group podcast. Then the week after that, I believe it's another, it's either Alex or it's one of the Aulia. With Moeen, so we'll see. All right, guys, I think we, we got an hour and two minutes here. Jazakumullah khairan, subhanakallahumma. Wa bihamdika, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. Wal asr, inna al-insana la fi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu salihat. Wa tuwasubu al-haq, wa tuwasubu al-sabr. Wassalamu alaykum.